Julio and I had, had talked several months ago about trying to, to do some sort of presentation webcast about um, Active Directory and auditing Active Directory. And really the, the original idea is how can we find a way to provide people the ability to start getting information out of AD themselves. But what happened is we, we realized that looking back at the other webcasts and presentations out there, while there are many of them and they're remarkably good, most of them are talking about security concerns and not necessarily what to look for specifically to see if maybe you have a security concern regarding Active Directory. And uh, part of the interesting idea there for me is that really anybody can really start looking for these issues and, and really start taking some ownership and be in, uh, independent to gather some of this data. Uh, it doesn't require anybody to have considerable rights in Active Directory or even a, a huge amount of knowledge about how Active Directory works to know if maybe there are some things you want to dig into a little bit further with uh, your, your um, support groups or whoever might be managing Active Directory. But then when we talked about it some more, uh, we realized that I was starting way too technical and maybe we should bring it back a little bit. So really we took this entire talk and we said, let's let's break it down a little bit more and maybe we'll have some more uh, entries into the series later, right? But we wanna start by covering some fundamentals. Let's talk about AD a little bit, let's see what it is. Then we could talk about how anybody can really get some data that you want. Uh, that way we empower the people who are listening to this, empower auditors to be able to, to get this information themselves. And then we're gonna go over what probably the biggest issue is with Active Directory security and maybe what you wanna look for. So with all that, start with me. I'm Eric Keen. I'm a principal security consultant with Secure Ideas. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Secure Ideas is, uh, we are a security consulting group. We do pen testing, general security consulting and training as well as webcasts. I'm based out of Charlotte, even though our headquarters is down in Jacksonville. Um, before I became part of Secure Ideas, I was responsible for a very large uh, Active Directory environment, um, considered one of the largest and most complex in the world, at least we like to think that. Uh, but really, I have over 20 years experience dealing with Active Directory and Windows systems and applications. I've been able to deal with Active Directories before it was officially released, and it's kind of been my focus uh, for quite a while. I'm also pretty good with systems architecture in general. I like pen testing, doing secure, security consulting, and I'm a MITRE ATT&CK framework contributor. Uh, if you're not familiar with the MITRE ATT&CK framework, something I, I think everybody who's involved in cybersecurity should start to understand and look at. It's a great method for everybody, whether you're a pen tester or on the offensive side or somebody on the defensive side or somebody just trying to understand what's going on. Uh, it's a great way for us to have a common method to talk to each other. Uh, just like many different uh, groups out there, IT and IT security has a whole bunch of acronyms and everybody likes to use different terms. If we start referencing one general consistent framework, it might help us talk better with each other. Uh, when I'm not working uh, or doing pen tests, I like watching movies, I like playing games, and I'm a father of four. I used to say my hobbies were taking my kids to their hobbies, uh, but really now it's I get to watch movies with my kids and uh, do a lot of different things since they're getting older. Julio? All right, sir. <clears throat> well, thank you. So, uh, Julio Torado, I'm the Director of Internal Audit at Spirit Bank. We are a community bank headquartered in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I uh, have uh, over 14 years experience and deceivingly old, uh, primarily in, in internal audit. Uh, I, I took a I had a year uh, excursion as an ISO, as a security officer, a year excursion as a risk management officer. Uh, but it's, been, it's been primarily in banking and, and, and internal audit, uh, especially if you tend to be a generalist, you play with, with every area within, within a company or, or an agency. Uh, so that, that's been me, someone that plays with a little bit with a lot of things. And security is the one that's the most fun, and the most challenging because it changes the most. Uh, being, being a banker, a bank employee, uh, I've had some specialties in banking, commercial lending, and other things. So it's, uh, it's been very, very interesting. Uh, I, I, I'll add one tidbit uh, to, to Eric. I only have one kid, <laughs> but he, he's been a handful enough as it is. He's actually uh, 18 now. So I'm, now I'm trying to find hobbies. You know, how do I, how do I make up for my boy being independent? Uh, but my, my interests, I, I love to learn. I have in there that I'm a, a lifelong learner, a complete dork, because I like to make sense of the world. And I love to practice Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, probably because I love to learn because with Jiu-Jitsu, jiu there's just infinite number of 
techniques and variations and attacks and defenses. So, you know, I'm, I'm like getting excited just talking to you about it because <laughs> there's so much to do. Uh, but I appreciate Eric having me on. This is this is a really important discussion, and I have to say, I'm may, maybe getting ahead of your impression. Uh, but uh, Eric is absolutely one of a kind. He's a very knowledgeable actor, director. So when, when he speaks AD, I think we all listen. So thank you. <laughs> now, now I have to blush. Uh, geez, thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> so for us to, to kick off here, um, as I said, let's start. We want to start with some basics. And this is because I think everybody is aware that Active Directory is out there. And almost everybody is aware that Active Directory is a huge target for attackers. But the question is why? Why is, is it so big? What makes it so important? Well, Active Directory is pretty much the de facto authentication source for most enterprises when you're talking about a Windows environment. Uh, Microsoft was nice enough to include it for free with the server OS. And actually back in 2000 or just before, they really pushed hard to have Active Directory be included in all the enterprises because Exchange 2000 required Active Directory. So they they like they do with most of their products, they wrapped it together and said, well, if you want to start using this, which you were before, you have to now upgrade this as well. They were competing with other directories at, at that point, but since then, Active Directory really has probably become the, the largest and most common directory out there for organizations. Now, Eric, can we place a number to that? Do you have any, any estimate, official or gut feel, what proportion of enterprises are actually leveraging Active Directory? So, <laughs> I hate giving a number, but I would say it's probably 95% or higher, right? If you're using Windows in an enterprise, you're using Active Directory. Now, Microsoft is slowly beginning to make a shift so that Active Directory is less important. Um, that you know They've been pushing their cloud products heavily for the last several years, and they're, they're slowly making advances to make AD less of a requirement. But really, if you're running Windows and you want to be able to have one centralized place for identity management um, and also get some great methods for doing some controls around your environment, uh, doing some lockdowns uh, or enforcing policies on, on Windows devices, you really need AD still. So it, it really is huge. I would say that out of all of the groups that I've pen tested over the last four years, there's only been two that have not leveraged Active Directory. Yeah, and so there, Nathan also, see, he said he can think of two customers in nine years that didn't use AD, and they were completely <clears throat> OS X and Linux. Same experience, that's why I was, I was trying to think as I was rattling numbers. Uh, one that I dealt with was completely uh, cloud-based um, and no Windows devices whatsoever, so they didn't use AD. And then there was another that was um, mainly focused on using uh, Mac devices. So once again, same general idea. I can't think of any group that's using a Windows environment that isn't using AD. So it's out there. It's um, here to stay and it needs to be on the on the internal audit radar. Sounds absolutely, like yeah. absolutely. Um, so there's some common terms to throw out with Active Directory. And the first is this idea of a domain versus a forest. A domain is what probably everybody thinks about when you're talking about Active Directory. It is the collection of different objects, whether that's users or the computers or groups, uh, anything really in that environment, that Windows environment, those are all objects. A forest, on the other hand, is a collection of domains that all share a couple of common pieces of information. Um, and that really is based upon what objects and attributes can be in that forest because people can make their own if they want. Um, and also some common replication boundaries. Really, those are the, the main ideas that, that join a bunch of domains together into a forest. So Eric, pointing, pointing your, to your diagram on the right, the, mm -hmm. the, the triangles represent what, a domain? Yep, the triangles in that, in that uh, diagram are the domains. And then everything together here is one forest. And you'll notice that they don't all share a similar name. That's one common misconception that if you're in a forest, you have to have the share, you have to share the same general namespace. And that's not true. Uh, you can have disjoint namespaces. It really is all about that, that common schema, that common grouping of objects and attributes for those objects. Another big misconception is if you're in one domain, you have set up some sort of security boundary between you and every other domain in that forest. And unfortunately, that is not true. 
a forest is really the security boundary, right? So as soon as you are a member of any one of those domains, you have a user ID in any one of those domains, you immediately have some sort of rights and permissions in every other domain. It might be you can only see some pieces of information, but you already, you're there. You are considered authenticated. You can see pretty much anything regarding uh, Active Directory, as well as a whole bunch of other information on the Windows devices. So domains really are replication boundaries. Your forest is the security boundary. Um, many actual uh, AD administrators often forget this fact, and that leads to many wonderful methods for me to start moving between domains uh, when we're pen testing an environment. So the next big uh, set of terms is a domain controller versus a gl global catalog. Uh, really, they're, they're kind of universal right now. There used to be some real separation between the two, but a domain controller is the server that is running Active Directory. It's just a special name for that server. Um, a global catalog is an additional part uh, within that domain that is shared information. It's, it's a subset of information that is common to all of the domains in that forest. So it's part of that replication that's going around. And really that's some information to help exchange work better more than anything else. Uh, but it can be leveraged to, to grant access across multiple domains, et cetera. So domain controller is just a specific server. It's a fancy name for a server. And then global catalog is a special portion of that domain controller. Then we get to the, the meat of Active Directory and that's the objects and attributes. Objects are what they sound like. They're, they're the general overarching item that we want to talk about. So. These consist typically of users, groups, computers, printers. There's a whole slew of them, but they are a, a identity of some type. The attributes then are different pieces of information that are tied to each one of those objects in the directory. And that information, once again, is gonna be the same in all of the domains in the forest. Now, what information you actually enter to those attributes is different for the different objects, but really your selection of objects and attributes are the same. Then we have to cover another important thing here called an organizational unit. These are a way of logically grouping different objects together within a domain. Uh, groups and administrators have different methods that they use. Sometimes it's done by region or geographic location. Other times it could be by function. Really, there's no hard and fast way that it's done. It's just however the administrator feels like they want to group these objects together so that they can do specific things. And these are applying different permissions um, to the objects in that OU, or we want to have a, a different set of policies that we're enforcing on these objects. Um, and then also it can be used to filter when applications or people are doing searches. But really, it's all about making those changes and permissions. So, Instead of saying, I need to log in with my highest level of permissions to do anything in AD, maybe it's been set up where we've allowed this other group like the help desk to be able to go in and change passwords or group membership for some of the users in the domain. And therefore we've grouped those user objects together in WinOU and the administrators applied a security change at that OU saying here and anything below it is where the help desk can make those changes, right? So any user object that exists in this OU or below it, the help desk can come in and force a password change. It's all about changing permissions. I feel like we need to call this object access management because it sounds like we, we need to think about all that can be done relative to different objects. Is that is that really the way to view this? That That is one of the biggest reasons, yes, and, and best ways of thinking about having a different organizational unit. Uh, but people create them for many other reasons, but really that's the core reason that you want to do it, absolutely. Um, and that's actually gonna tie in very well to one of the core problems that we have. And so we'll get to that shortly in just a minute. Um, one important thing, and I said it before, is that anybody in the forest, so any person or any computer um, that is able to log into a domain in the forest can pretty much see all of the data in Active Directory for any of the objects. What can go there, wrong? <laughs> what was that? What can go wrong, right? Yeah, said. what can go wrong? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. When you talk to security professionals or hard and fast, they say, well, this is a horrible idea. 
But really the idea of a directory is to give people the ability to see mm -hmm. information. You think of it like the old phone book, right? I need to look up somebody and know who they are. I need to know where their address is. All of this information that's stored in Active Directory, minus a couple of key pieces, should be information that you want people to be able to see. And this actually can be used against folks as well, because I have run into environments where administrators start putting information in AD that they maybe they shouldn't. Like, we're going to store a password in AD for this, this account. Bad idea, because anybody can see that. Right. Um, and we'll, we'll cover that in a little bit about how you can see that information. So really anything in AD should be considered, you know, public, we won't say public, we'll see proprietary information, right? Information that anybody in the company or, or organization should be able to see about any of these users or computers or whatever it might be. Now, some information can't be read, uh, passwords, right? Uh, no one can actually see the password of anybody else. Um, and some other pieces that are hidden, but really almost everything in AD can be read by anybody as soon as they can log in. Now, quick, quick question for you on that slide. Um, mm -hmm. To put things into context, and th this is where, you know, one of the challenges for, for some of us in audit is, is that we don't have the experience as an IT administrator, AD or otherwise. So there's just sometimes there's a lot of context we don't have. And you did a great job explaining what a domain controller is, domains. So now my question is, what what is what is a typical configuration for the typical company look like? Do we typically are most companies, for example, companies with one domain, or are most companies like the diagram that you have there, where there are multiple domains within one large forest? What 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 are we typical? What's most likely to be the case? So um, I think it depends on size. I would say when you're dealing with a group that's we're going to say less than 500 employees, mm -hmm. you probably see a single domain. Um, if you are in a larger organization, you probably have two or maybe more than two, depending on, on some requirements. Uh, best example I have of requirements, um, I said that a domain is a replication boundary, right? So we want to make sure that all of the data that's being passed around between the domain controllers is, is up to date um, as quickly as it can be. So. Uh, when I worked at Disney and we supported the, um, the I supported the forest there. Part of the forest consisted of the cruise line ships. Each ship was its own domain. Um, and that's so we can control the replication and make sure that they stayed up to date because as a cruise ship goes out to sea, it you know loses its good strong connection and has to go by whatever it has on board, right? So that was a reason that we needed an extra domain at that layer. Uh, but there are other reasons. Um, people like to have their UAT domains, but really the most common configuration is one or two is what I see most often. Um, and then maybe a third at rare occasions. Thank you. Uh, so Nathan brought up a question. Uh, should restrict environments like uh, uh, PCI environments be in a separate domain or a separate force? That is an awesome question. And it goes back to how secure you want to make it. Um, and if anything in that CDE needs to reach out to a common set of devices for whatever it might be, right? Maybe common management systems, et cetera. The problem is as soon as it's part of that same domain and you share some authentication source, there is a way to break in to that environment, right? Um, good example that I have here is a, a client of ours had a separate domain in the forest and that domain was locked down to the CDE. Okay, so all of the devices in the CDE talk to this specific domain. You, you, However, you, might, you might quickly define what CDE is. Uh, the, the card data environment. So that's where what you're really trying to lock down and, and keep separate, uh, more keep separated from the rest of your normal corporate environment. Uh, helps restrict uh, what's in scope when you're, you're doing a pen test, as well as a whole bunch of other great reasons to have it separated. Uh, but so this highly secure environment uh, had a, its own unique domain, but it was part of the very common forest. Well, Nathan and I went in, we compromised one domain in that forest. And because domain controllers do need to talk to each other all the time, uh, we were able to jump from that one domain controller that was outside the CDE into the domain controller in the CDE and then have full control over all the devices in the CDE. So 
for the most secure option, you want to have it can be completely separate, just like for the most secure option in general, you want to have everything in that CDE be uh, restricted and completely uh, segmented away from the rest of your environment. But you might want to relax it in some cases, depending on what you want to do. What I would say, though, is for a CDE or other very restricted environment, you probably would want to have it set where the domain controllers cannot initiate communication into the CDE. Domain controllers respond to requests. They never push information to devices. So there's no reason to have your domain controller be able to reach out to a device in the domain. Uh, it should only work the other way. So that kind of took us a slightly off topic. But uh, overall, if you want to have complete separation, you need to have it be a separate forest. So as I said, Active Directory and domain controllers are a target. Uh, the thing is, by default, they are remarkably secure on their own. Yes, there are zero-day exploits that happen. There have been some general uh, issues that make it less secure. But really, you know, that's like any sort of system, unfortunately, where there's an issue, uh, you know, a programming issue, a development issue. But really, on its own, Active Directory is remarkably secure. You need to have some sort of ID to interact with it. Um, and hopefully, you don't have more permissions than you need in it. So what happens is when you're doing a typical attack, uh, you an attacker starts with some low privileged account, um, finds some information that, to know what the domain in Forest is. Uh, maybe they get credentials after the fact, some normal user credentials, or they start immediately because somebody clicked the wrong link or did something else. Uh, you the attacker sees what that low privileged user can do, what access they can get to. Um, look for key pieces of information in AD, then start moving from device to device and escalating their privileges until they get admin access to a domain controller and then everything's over. As soon as you compromise one domain controller or a domain admin or highly privileged account in one domain, you have complete control over the forest and then pretty much complete control over every device in that forest. This picture that I have over here is like the easy button for attackers. It's a tool called Bloodhound. Uh, Bloodhound goes out and will query information out of Active Directory and paint this beautiful you know, step-by-step -step process of, you're here, I need you to go to this device because you're an admin here, where this guy is logged in who is a member of this group that makes him an administrator on this box, and it gives you the picture of step-by-step -step where to go. Um, another side note, this is a great tool for blue teams to use or even potentially auditors. It's just a little bit more in depth than an auditor would typically need to know. Uh, because it's very detailed and you have to understand what all the different steps are. So maybe this is more than you need, but it shows how easy it is to get this information in, in an environment um, and how easy it is typically for an attacker to move from some normal user to a highly privileged account. Why can they do that? Well, as I said, Active Directory by on its own is remarkably secure. The problem is we as administrators of AD have done things to make it less secure. And most of it all revolves around poor account management. The biggest one we see in most environments and most people will probably agree with is we have weak passwords and password management on our accounts. Most environments are still saying eight characters is enough for a password. That's really not enough. But on top of that, even if you use longer characters, uh, passwords are typically still very weak, right? They're, they're common words in, in password lists with a, a common scheme, right? Like a capital letter at the beginning, some word, and then a couple numbers, and maybe an exclamation point at the end, right? Something like that. Weak passwords, easy to guess, right? Summer 2021 would be the one that Nathan pointed. And when we go do an internal pen test next week, I will be doing a password spray where I get the list of all the user accounts in the domain. I will send that out and say, try and log in with this ID and this password, summer 2021, and I will bet that I will get at least one hit. There has yet to be an environment where we don't get at least one hit on that scheme, right? Which is, why does it work? Well, it's something that you'll always remember, and because passwords change every 90 days, it will always work. And even the shortest one, which is fall 2021, still meets that eight character max, and it has all, all the complexity needs to pass Microsoft complexity. So it's gonna work, you're gonna get at least one because people are lazy when it comes to passwords. Even if we don't do summer 2021, 
you know, you probably, if you change your password, all you do is you increment a number at the end, something like that. And this happens not only for regular user accounts, but admin accounts often have shared the same password scheme, service accounts share this password scheme. It, it's just how it's been done, making it very easy for attackers to compromise passwords either by guessing or getting hashes or something else in the environment. So how, how, you how often are you guys seeing enterprises using uh, uh, password managers? And is that something that you think auditors should be specifically looking into, maybe even recommending? So when you say password manager, um, or, or, I'm, I'm going to be very specific. You're not talking about a credential vault, but like a password manager for managing all of the different uh, passwords I have for different applications out there. Something like maybe LastPass or, or CyberArk is a credential manager, but uh, something like that. Or, or are you really talking about where we, we store our credentials to gain admin access or, or what? You know, I would say both because the, the, the storing a password vault for just purely for, for administrative access management, I know it's mm -hmm. must have, but as it relates to everybody else within the domain, are, are you seeing the adoption of multi of uh, password managers widespread or is it limited just, just to the, those who need it in the IT audit space, in the IT administration space? It's a great question. So I, I would say that it's not as prevalent as I would like to see. Um, I, I would say maybe 30% of the people that I have dealt with over the last four years had it. Um, I would say it's not the most common one. Um, it's definitely something that I think people should start using at home, especially even if you don't allow it at work. Corporations, so what's happened in, in, in organizations, hmm, we have a cyclical nature as always, I'm trying to think of the best way of putting this. So it used to be, Every device had its own unique ID and password, right? You needed to have 40 different passwords, hard to manage. And then everybody said, let's have single sign-on. And now everybody has one password. So you don't necessarily need to store all these passwords. And now it's kind of breaking apart again where you should have more than one password. Um, so really it's something I think it should be invited to for, for people. Um, multiple reasons here, not just so that they're storing them in a secure manner instead of like perhaps in a, a text file on their desktop, uh, but also so that maybe they can have stronger passwords be assigned and unique passwords be assigned to different things. Um, especially in this new age where we have all of these cloud-based and web-based applications that organizations are using, we see passwords being reused between all these things. And then yes, once again, as Nathan said, stored somewhere, whether that's in a text file or, or a Excel file, whatever it might be, they're being stored somewhere. If organizations would give their people some place to store this information, that would be better than what they're doing now. I think it's something that should be there, uh, but I have to preface that with that system should have its own password, right? Shouldn't be single sign on to get into it and it really needs MFA. It needs to have right. some other set before you can access it. Um, and then when we're talking about privilege access management, that's a great thing to implement. Uh, but I'd still say most orgs are not doing it because it's very expensive, um, among other reasons. Another thing that would be great to do, right, just in time administration would solve many issues, but difficult to implement, to say the least. And to your point, in the absence of MFA, it's a single point of failure, having all your credentials, obviously, in one, yep. one central location. Yep, exactly. So we have weak passwords in the environment that are shared or reused. Then we have overly broad permissions. Um, people are, are, are not, yeah, post-it notes. You know what, Gordon? I, at this point, Nathan might yell at me for saying this or other people might disagree. I would rather that you had a post-it note that was underneath your keyboard than you stored it on a text file or you put it, you know, in on, you, on a shared drive or something like that. At least then I need to get physical access to your box to do it. Um, you know, storing it in your browser or in a text file means electronically it's very easy to get to. No, I'm not saying actually go store your passwords on a post-it note. <laughs> but I, my parents especially, I'd rather they did that uh, <laughs> if handled properly. Yeah. Yes. Hopefully physical access is harder to get to. But we have overly broad permissions as well. Uh, People, it still to this day, that whole idea of least privilege is not being used, right? Instead of where I just need read access, I've been granted read write access. There's this credential and permission creep, scope creep that happens over time environments where people change roles, but their, their group membership and permissions never change. And you have your 
person in HR who used to be a DBA, but is still a DBA, common all the time. Uh, and then on top of that, we have this idea of lack of account segmentation. Uh, I don't want to get into it in too much detail, but high level account segmentation. Uh, this is what I still see in most environments. Maybe, hopefully, please, hopefully, people have two accounts. Their normal account that's done for emails, viewing documents, all this other stuff. And then they have a separate account that they use for administrative access to servers, workstations, Active Directory, et cetera. Hopefully, it's at least two. But this is not enough at all. Uh, this makes jumping way too easy between systems in a Windows environment because Windows wants to be helpful and, and help everybody, including attackers. This is a better idea of how it should be, right? This is account tiering and, and a better idea of account segmentation where you have your least secure ID, IDs or your normal user out there that can only log on to workstations or maybe a terminal server and they're only a normal user. And then you have your workstation admin account that can be an administrator on, on workstations and, and laptops. And then you have a server admin account and then a domain object admin account, which is an account that can do privileged things or write information to objects in AD. And then finally your domain admin account. And the idea is these never interact with each other. Um, you don't have somebody who's an administrator on a device um, be able to access a higher permissioned account on that same device. And this kind of gives walls between your, your devices and makes it harder for an attacker to jump from a less uh, secure device to a more secure device. But this is not what we see. Um, and, and this is really one of the two major things that we actually want to look at right now when we're talking about, hey, let's start auditing our, auditing our environment. What do we look for? What's the biggest issue, right? And this is part of it. Regardless of the, the other talks that are saying, hey, you can go out and you can do a curb roasting attack and you can do a, an AS, AES rep roasting attack or, or whatever the term is or whatever specific attack it is, it doesn't make a difference. All these attacks are trying to do one specific thing and that's gain some access to something in AD that has some rights to do something in AD other than reading information or maybe gain admin access to a server, but we're gonna, we're talking about AD here. So all of the attacks, all of the things that are out there that other talks are, are bringing up are really, how can attacker an attacker gain access to one of these critical accounts, okay? But what's a critical or privileged account? A privileged account is anything that has more than read access in Active Directory. I can write data to this attribute that is privileged access and might be useful somehow, right? Or um, I'm a member of a critical AD group and I've listed the critical AD groups on the left side. What makes them critical are they either have incredible amounts of rights and privileges within your Forrester domain, or at minimum, they have the ability to log on to a domain controller, but they can do more than that. Enterprise admins are administrators in every single domain in the forest. Right? So if you have four domains, they are an administrator in each one. Domain admins are special administrators in a domain. And really that extra special part is they have the inherent ability to log on to every device in that domain. They have a couple of other special permissions, but really that's their main focus is their, their extra benefit. Then you have the built-in administrators. That is like an administrator on the server, any server or your workstation, except taken to a domain. So that means they can log on to a domain controller. They can make changes to a domain controller. They can take ownership of any object or anything in AD or make any changes they want in that domain. They just can't necessarily log on to every device in the domain, but they are very powerful all the same. Uh, then we have account operators, which is a group that has the ability to modify pretty much any group or user uh, in the in that domain. Uh, there are some limitations, um, but pretty much anything, just not very, very highly privileged counts. Backup operators can log on to domain controllers, but they can also perform backup or restore operations on domain controllers. So I can back up the files and take them offline, crack them offline. Print operators manage printers, but have the ability to log on to domain controllers for some reason, I guess, in case you want to put a printer on a domain controller. I don't recommend that at all. Please don't do that. Uh, and then server operators 
once again, have the ability to log on to domain controllers and do admin-like functions on the domain controller, just not in AD. And then there are a couple other special groups there that can do extra things. But these are groups that we want to know who's a member of these groups, right? We want to know that information. If we can find that information and we can find out where these people are doing these activities, we can better protect these accounts, right? We have the key questions there, and then I'll jump over to the granted right access, right? Because the key questions are the same for critical AD members of critical AD groups or if they've been given right access. We want to know where these people are, are doing their work. Are they doing their work on their workstations? Right? Do they log into their workstations with a privileged account? Or do they use the run as feature? If you're not familiar, that is, um, I, I right click an executable and I say run as another user. When you do a run as another user, it effectively logs that user in. It's better than logging in as the account itself, but it places all of the information on that device that an attacker can then use to, to move and pivot. Right, So you've added a little bit of security between logging in directly with that account, but not enough to make it very worth it when we're talking about security. Now, right, Eric, so, <clears throat> quick quick question for you on the on the it, it's, it kind of correlates to the tiering slide, but obviously related to the the uh, critical groups. So, a, a hypothetical organization, let's say there's uh, you know twenty IT administrators. I, I I know enough to know that they can't all have domain admin. The question they shouldn't, but they might. Right? Yes, they might. Practically speaking, but. But to your point about needing to tier the accounts, nothing nothing new there. We want, I know, at uh, least privileges. It needs to be appropriate given the role uh, of everybody and what needs to be done. But is there a, a rule of thumb, maybe a Microsoft best practice standard that we should shoot for that helps gauge, depending on the organization, depending on the number of domains, the four size, et cetera, how, how, how can one, how can an auditor make some reasonable, come to some conclusion about the reasonableness of that tiering? What makes sense? So, ooh, that's hard. So for me, I would go back to there needs to be at least two accounts, right? At least two. And then it's a discussion with your operations group. I personally, coming from a, a more secure background, I had over 20 accounts at my previous organization. I understand uh, that that might be overkill. But it all comes to how obstructive it is for your operational people and administrative people to do their job versus how secure you want to make it. So that is a business decision. This here, though, is really the bare minimum that I feel comfortable with, right? Uh, having less than having two or less makes it very easy for an attacker to pivot. You're relying on controls that can be bypassed, like anti-malware or, or other things like that. You, you, you have a very open path. It's like a major highway uh, for an attacker to use to gain escalation and escalate and move in your, your domain and devices. So this four is like the bare minimum that I recommend. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Uh, so the other big question in general is, are any of these accounts special? you know, privileged, are they separate accounts or are people still using just a normal account that has email? A uh, quick question came in, does Runas store the credentials in memory for Mimikatz or other things? That is absolutely true. As soon as you do Runas, those credentials, the password hash and other information are immediately stored in that device's memory. If an attacker has admin access, they can get that information out of memory to use it. And does it need a restart to clear the credentials out of memory? No. It just doesn't happen as fast as you think it does. When you log out, your, your information is not immediately cleared from memory unless specific settings have been put in place. There is a cleanup process that happens, but it is not immediate. It takes some time for that to, to clear out. So after you log out, those credentials are still there until that cleanup process happens on its own or you reboot. So. We want to know who those members of critical AD groups are. We also want to know anybody who has right access to things in AD, whether that is computer objects, user objects, whatever it might be. So we're looking at OUs and containers, different object types. Um, if they have the ability to make, if they have any right access to this special thing called admin SD holder, admin SD holder is a special object where the permissions, think of it like a template. The permissions on that template are copied 
and overwrite any permissions on any of those critical AD groups, or at least most of those critical AD groups on the left. So if the permissions on admin SD holder are not that secure, like, oh, it's set to inherit permissions, which means I'll take whatever's from above me, I, it makes it very easy or easy to make those uh, other groups less secure. So we need to know what the security is on that ad admin SD holder object. And then we also need to look for this very special, right, at the root of the domain, the very top level of the domain, are called replicate directory changes all. Any ID that has that right has the ability to just pull password hashes out of Active Directory. So we need to know about those specific things. And we're looking for permissions that really fall into a couple of categories, generic all, which is you have full control. You can do anything you want with that object. Um, you can delete it, you can change it, you can reset a password, whatever you want. Uh, you have a write permission of any kind. That's why I said write star, because there are multitudes of write permissions. You have the ability to create or delete them or create GPOs, which are our ways of forcing policies down on, on Windows devices. So this is kind of what we want to look at at a high level. If we know this information, even though we don't know all the details about these accounts, but if we know where these accounts are, where they're being used, we have a better idea of knowing if they are secure or not. So as auditors, we want to know those accounts. So then we can go back to our operations group or administrator group and say, hey, these accounts, how are they being used? Are they being used in a secure manner, right? How, what are your policies around these things? Let's talk about this. So maybe we can find out if they are being maintained well or not. And part of that is not gonna be what you could bring up password policy if you want, but it, it really is about, let's talk about these IDs. For us to get this information, we need a couple of things. Uh, we need the Active Directory tools, the RSET tools installed on our workstation. Some administrators may not like this. Uh, there, there's the idea of maybe we've given an easy way for an attacker to get information out of AD. And I my counterpoint to that is, um, an attacker is probably not going to leverage these tools because they're not on most devices, right? Attackers are going to be there and have other means of getting it where they don't need to rely on these tools to be there. These tools are meant to make people's lives easier to getting information. So yes, it would make an attacker's life easier if they had only built their tools to use it, right? They're behind the screen scripts, things like that. There's, there's really no reason that we need we should think we need to hide information from AD from our users, normal users. The only reason you need to hide that information is if, once again, we're putting things there that shouldn't be there anyways, right? So there's really no reason not to have RSAT, the Active Directory tools installed on your device as an auditor, right? Be able to get this information yourself. This will bring up both the graphical tools and some commandlets, which we'll use with PowerShell. A uh, quick pro tip here, if you want to actually use the GUI tool called Active Directory Users and Computers, uh, be sure that you enable the advanced features, which is done under the view menu, so you can actually see all the information on those objects that you're looking at. But really, we're here to talk about automation as well, which is why I bring up PowerShell. Now, if you understand PowerShell, that's awesome. If you don't, don't worry about it. I have scripts for you to use already to give you some information, all right? But PowerShell is included on every Windows device. It's there to make automated tasks easier. We want to get information out of AD easier, so let's leverage PowerShell to do it so we don't have to do it manually. Your organization might say that you can't run unsigned scripts or you can't run scripts at all. Uh, you can find that out by opening PowerShell and running that get execution policy command. If it comes back with restricted or signed only or anything other than unrestricted, you aren't supposed to be able to run scripts. I'm hereby going to turn you all into hackers. Have a nice day. There's a command you can run that's called PowerShell.exe bypass. That will open up PowerShell and let you run scripts. Now, I'm not saying maybe you should do that. The better way might be to go out and talk to your organization and say, I have these scripts I'd like to run. Uh, you say they need to be signed. Could you sign these scripts? Even though I wrote them, your own administrators could sign them and therefore allow them to be used by you. Now, in the interest of minimizing heart attacks by whoever's running the IT enterprise, <laughs> uh, you, know, you, you, you talked about uh, RSAT being uh, a, a low, low risk concern for you because it's not leveraged by attacks currently. Um, yep. You just talked about being able to potentially run scripts, whether signed or unsigned. Uh, any additional layers of protection that we could add to a particular user account on AD or the, the auditor's machine 
that, that would give whoever's potential granting that access, uh, give them some comfort. So I, I, I would go back to, you should be running these things with low privilege accounts, your normal user account, which, which should not have any ability to write information in AD, hopefully. Um, but once again, the core idea of Active Directory is this information is supposed to be viewable by anybody in your organization. Considering it confidential or restricted to specific people is a fallacy. And, and there are other ways that you anybody could get this information, right? We're, we're trying to make it easier for the people supporting the environment and getting information for business reason to get it. And that's really why these tools exist. Excellent. So the first script I have uh, up here, audit critical AD groups. By the way, these are stored in GitHub and I have the location down there at the bottom. I write these scripts to be very understandable. Uh, so I don't hide byte code. I don't do anything in there that other people might do. It's all using PowerShell AD commandlets to get the information very easy to read because PowerShell is very verbose. Uh, it tells you what it's doing. It's a verb and, and a noun. So it's going to say, get user. You, you know what it's doing. It's getting user information. Uh, but audit critical AD groups is a script I put up there that will get you basic information about members of those critical AD groups that I mentioned before a couple slides ago, right? Enterprise admins, domain admins, et cetera. It will go out, it will que query all of those groups in the forest, in every domain in your forest, and it will tell you who the member is, what domain that account is in, uh, and then some other information that might let you know if maybe it's a less secure account. So we, as we look at it here, I have it split into three sections. There's a general info, which is here's the group, um, the domain that group is in, the group name, the account that I have in that group. And then uh, we get into things that might say, maybe this is an issue we should look at, right? Hey, there's an email address associated with this account. Hmm, maybe this is used for more than just admin stuff. Maybe it shouldn't be here. We should talk about this one a little bit more. And then I have the other stuff over there that says you really need to look at this account with your, your um, administrative group, your AD administrators. Those three columns over there are means that account can be attacked easily um, without needing to be on a special device, right? So the password's in clear text. Uh, that means it when you change your password for that account, it's not a hash. It actually is just the password. Uh, so it's stored on the device in clear text. It's stored in AD in clear text. Now, how uh, often then, do you see auditors do this inquiry with or without PowerShell? Never. Hmm. Right. Uh, at most, what I see auditors asking for, are how many domain admins do you have? Right. That's the limit that I know most auditors are going. That's not really covering it all, right? This is a little bit more detailed, absolutely, but it gives a much better idea of your environment. And all of these things, all of these accounts should be controlled somehow. Yeah, th this clearly ups the game. And I, I I, I would I would hypothesize that sometimes the things that we ask for, the things that we look into, may be driven by frameworks like like SOX or or, or, or Fedisha or other programs that are maybe are, are less driven by security, more driven about financial reporting and accounting. Yep. But I mean, the way you're approaching is for me from the attacker's perspective. That's that's my impression. Uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, that is how I'm doing it, and that's unfortunately how we should be thinking, right? Um, the Great saying, you, everybody is going to be hacked. Everybody is going to be attacked, right? It's how many roadblocks, how many steps does somebody have to take before it's a really bad situation? So defense and, and depth. Yeah, exactly, defense and depth. How many things do they have to try and get through that hopefully we as a defensive group can see and say, oh, something strange is there, right? So this starts at the highest level of let's know who these accounts are Maybe they have some risky things going on, like the email address, or maybe they're a member of 40 other groups. There's no way that that, it, that account, if it's a member of 40 other groups, is being used for just specific things mm -hmm. in AD, right? It's being used for other things. So we want to know that. It doesn't mean maybe it's 40 different groups because they some have been given the ability to write to 40 different attributes on an object, right? Maybe there is a reason. Highly unlikely, though. So it's something for us to say this is an oddity 
let's talk to our admins about it. And then once again, those far right things that must be investigated, they need to be investigated. This is a problem that needs to be corrected. And then I have a similar script here for Audit 80 writers. By the way, this first picture here came when I said, uh, display it as a table, which is the Audit Critical AD Groups PS1 uh, format table is what I did there. Um, to run the script, you just have to get the script from GitHub, download it to your device, open PowerShell, and run this after you have the AD um, RSET tools installed on your device. There's nothing else that you have to do, pass it on to other commands that will just run behind the scenes. This one then is looking for who has the ability to make changes to information in AD, even if they're not a member of a critical group, right? One of those critical AD groups. Matter of fact, I exclude those critical AD groups from this script because they should have that right to do something already. So we're looking for other people, right? If we know who's a member of those critical AD groups, we don't need to look at it from this perspective as well because we know they're supposed to be able to do that stuff. So, this works pretty much the same way. The far left is, this is where the permissions have been assigned. Then the second one there is what the actual setting is. For an auditor, this is more detailed than you probably need, but I was having a hard time trying to condense it. But this is, they have the ability to write something, so let's discuss it with our group, right? That That's the gist of this. They have the ability to write something, let's talk about it, and then, what that access is actually granted to you, who actually has that access. So the identity reference is a group or a user that's been specified that has this permission. But then if it's a group, it goes out and it says, hey, there's actually 25 people in this group. And then it will list the members to the far right. So you have all that information to say, are all 25 of these accounts really the same, right? Or something you can take back to your administrators to talk about again. That's the point of both of these scripts. Let's get information so we can go back and have a better idea of our environment to go to our administrators and say, let's talk about this. Let's see what's going on. And how, how often would you run these scripts from, from, a, from a security perspective? What's the frequency that makes sense to you if you were the IT auditor? So for the auditor, I would go back to as often as you are doing an audit. Uh, for... Other people, I would say more often, but being an auditor, you, whether or not this is your organization, uh, in many groups that I go to, unfortunately, auditors are considered like um, a roadblock or a hindrance or a nuisance. Hopefully not. Hopefully auditors are considered a partner, which is what they're supposed to be, right? But and sometimes they're not. I can think of a couple of organizations where the people who the auditors are trying to talk to are very adversarial and only give specific answers, right? So you don't wanna become a nuisance. So only run this when you need to. Now, maybe you say, hey, this was something I found. Maybe it's something you wanna look at. Hopefully your administrators are doing this or something similar behind the scenes on their own. Well, you bring up an interesting point and I'll be brief because it looks like we're close to the end. I know, I'm like, oh geez, I talked to you. Um, you know, so, so sometimes there are political challenges with, with anything within within an audit for, for all sorts of you know, challenging reasons. But um, one of the things that in the internal audit committee we're trying to do is be more involved in continuous auditing, continuous monitoring, rather than in one point in time kind of deal. So you know, if, if I'm trying to be proactive about auditing security, maybe this is something that I can make into a quarterly workflow, quarterly process. Absolutely. And that's why I don't want to say it. you have to do it so often. It's whatever is great for your organization. At a minimum, I would see when you want to audit it. But I think that's a great idea, especially if you have that great, not compromise, um, um, cooperative feeling right. with your groups. Absolutely. Right. Very critical. Yep. So those are the two biggest things. Because like I said, most attackers are trying to get this information and leverage it for their malicious intent, right? If we know who these accounts are, we know where they're being used, and we can talk to our admins and try and find better ways of separating these out, we'll be much better off than, than we are right now. So those are the two scripts that I have and the two automation parts. And maybe we could bring in, as I said, later additional things. Maybe we want to have another script to find something more detailed. But I think these two together will give a much better understanding and a much better starting point for an auditor to go back to their groups and, and say, 
let's talk about this other than waiting for your administrators to come and say, here's our domain admins. And this is why I encourage all auditors to learn to code because the moments like this, you don't know <laughs> when you're gonna need a skill set. This is perfect. <laughs> yep. So I wanna talk about one other thing which has nothing to do with automation, but I think this needs to be brought up because I've been talking to lots of organizations and everybody's really interested in ransomware and what the impacts are to their environment. And as I talk to different groups, I'm finding how few of them have a good backup and recovery strategy for Active Directory. I find this mind boggling, but I also kind of understand it, right? Active Directory is highly resilient on its own. It, it is hard to take down, but it can happen, especially if we have bad account management. It's easy for an attacker to get that ransomware to run under the main controller and encrypt the drive or, or whatever. The problem is, because it's so resilient, most people don't consider AD the critical infrastructure that it is. And recovery plans are built upon the idea, idea that Active Directory is online already. Well, what happens if it's not? I, I, worst case scenario, I've gone to groups, even large groups, who don't have a recovery strategy at all for Active Directory. That's bad, right? But even the ones that do, don't take some key considerations into place, right? Are any of the steps in your recovery strategy dependent on AD being up to function? Things like where the location, that where that recovery plan is stored. If you need AD to get to that recovery plan and AD is offline, you can't get to the recovery plan to recover AD. Does your backup and recovery system need AD to be online? Most do to log into that admin console. Uh, how are you gonna communicate during a disaster if you can't get to your email or contact information because you needed AD to be online to get there? All of these things need to be considered. I bring this up since we're talking to auditors, this is a great thing to think about for a potential audit. Is there a real recovery strategy that has been tested at least through a walkthrough with your recovery group? So something to think of there. Uh, and then just some general uh, recommended. Oh, yeah, Nathan brought up. This is one of the best examples of why you need it. When not Petya hit, Maersk, the largest shipping company in the world, the only reason they survived is because one domain controller was offline at that point in time. That's the only reason they were able to recover without significant issues, right? At my previous job, uh, you know, we did AD replication. We had it down to 15 minutes worldwide. That meant if there was an issue, I had 15 minutes or less to stop it before it, it took us all down. So very important to have good recovery plans. Uh, so some general recommended learning sources in our last two minutes. Uh, if you're interested in best practices for AD, I have a link here for you. Um, this is written by Microsoft. It's several years old, but nothing has changed significantly in their ideas of securing AD since then. Uh, there's some general AD courses, one from Microsoft, another from uh, Udemy. The Udemy one is, is paid for, but it's a basic AD course. Uh, PowerShell, uh, we at Secure Ideas do have a Red Team Fundamentals for Active Directory course. Love to give that course. It's how does AD work and how can we attack it? And then YouTube as well. Uh, so uh, the AD recovery strategy talks about an AD to make controller that is a physical server. What about Azure AD? Uh, so that is a great question. It depends on what you're doing with, with Azure AD. So once again, if you have a domain controller hosted in Azure AD that is replicating information back and forth, sorry, you're replicating, let me rephrase, you have a domain controller hosted in Azure that is replicating information back and forth, Azure is just like a data center. If you compromise one domain controller, you have your replication time to, to get that guy safe. Azure AD itself, so we're talking about actual Azure AD, which is a, a product that manages your Azure applications and authentication into Azure and anything tied to Azure, is not really Active Directory. If you are using that for Office 365 and you do things like passwords, uh, hash sync up to Azure AD, you're okay, but that still may most likely will not help your on-prem environment. I say most likely because I don't know the specifics of how the setup is. There are ways of allowing things from Azure AD to authenticate back in, but that requires special setup. So my default answer is no, that is not going to help you except maybe allow your communication to continue working if your on-prem AD environment gets toasted. And we're at the top of the hour. I'll stay on for questions. I, I don't have to leave. Uh, I know I ran a little long there. Julio, do you have any other ideas, comments, questions, closing? 
Uh, yeah, well, I'd like to first of all say thank you for, for letting me be a guest for the little bit of contribution that I gave. Oh, no, you gave, <laughs> this you gave is, lots. This is, they were great this questions. Is, this is really insightful and it's absolutely powerful. And I, I encourage everybody in, in, in IT audit to to embrace it. I, I know I, so as someone who initially had a finance background, it can be really intimidating. But if there's one lesson that I've learned, whether it's Active Directory or it, pick, you pick your technology, uh, as, as an IT auditor, we, we have to strive to to gain the hands-on skills. So if you have the ability, if you have the time to leverage some of these resources, be it Udemy, uh, Microsoft resources, et cetera, and, and I just learn the concepts and reiterate the concepts that Eric shared, but actually build a virtual machine, build a, a create a domain controller, actually play with some configurations. I, I think that will go really far for you as an auditor. And to Eric's point about working with our IT and security brothers and sisters, I think it'll go really far in building that relationship as well. Absolutely. If you can talk the talk, right? Or if you can walk the walk, it's walk. better than just being able to talk the talk. Right. Absolutely.